Hello, everyone, and welcome to the most currently most recent edition of the Monday morning check in. Uh, I'm oh, Damon. Thanksgiving mm -hmm. week edition. Yeah, I guess. I suppose. I was thinking actually that this is a like this is a week that doesn't exist. And here's why I was thinking that if on if Sunday was the end of the year and this coming Sunday is the start of the year, then this week we currently are in some sort of time void, it would seem. You might need to explain that further to our loyal listeners, Damon. Why why was Sunday the end of the year? Why is next Sunday the start of the year? Yeah, well, I'm Damon. I'm one of the pastors at First Press Hastings, and you are? Greg, the other pastor at First Press Hastings, trying to get Damon to explain himself a little bit. So Sunday uh, was uh, Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King Sunday. Uh, it was the last day of the liturgical year in the church. And this coming Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent, which is the first day of the liturgical year in the church. So if the last day of the year was a, was yesterday and the first day of the year is in six days, then what is this? Then we don't exist is what you're saying? We, or we exist in some sort of time void. Here's, uh, here's my resolution for you on this uh, craziness of which you are speaking. We follow the Revised Common Lectionary, which is what helps us set the liturgical year. And so if you flip over to the Revised Common Lectionary, the good news, Damon, is that we are not in a time void. There's still one reading left for this year, which is the celebration of Thanksgiving Day in the United States, which has its own set of lectionary readings falling on Thursday, November 25th. So fortunately, we are not existing in a space-time continuum void, but instead are anxiously awaiting the Thanksgiving Day readings, which fall on the previous liturgical year before we jump into the new liturgical year starting on Sunday. But then Friday and Saturday will be a time. That, well, they, they won't exist, but we won't be doing a, a Monday check-in then, so it, then we don't have to resolve this question. Yeah, fair enough, I suppose. So uh, this is the... Resolve the question for now through Thursday. You're going to have to figure out whether or not you actually exist on Friday and Saturday, and then on Sunday, yeah. Happy New Year, we'll be in the... Yeah, I may not. Yeah, might be kind of a relief, you know, just take a break from everything for a couple of days. Isn't that what you're doing, Damon? Yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Monday check-in. And um, so what we're going to do after a little bit here is we're going to actually preview the upcoming Sunday. We're going to take a look at uh, some of the scriptures for the Sunday and talk a little bit about the, the themes in them, maybe some of the questions, maybe wonder why we're reading this. Uh, for that Sunday and uh, do that sort of a thing. And then we'll switch gears, talk a little bit about life of the church, life of First Pres Hastings. Um, so who's, uh, is it my turn to do opening prayer? Sure. Okay, fair enough. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, as we gather this morning, I ask that your presence might be with us as we read and study and begin to reflect on your scriptures ask that your Holy Spirit uh, might inspire us, might move us to ask key questions, important questions, might allow us to find uh, connections between your ancient words and our current lives. In your gracious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this coming Sunday, November 28th, let's call it 28th. Is it? No, I think it's the 29th. Is it? No, it's 28th. You're right. Um, is the first Sunday in Advent. And uh, one of the scriptures that we've uh, selected, oh, it's a bonus scripture, just uh, popped into there. So that's fun. Uh, we have two scripture readings that we're going to take a look at <laughs> this morning. Uh, one from First Thessalonians and one from the prophet Jeremiah. And let's read them in the order they were written. Can we do that? Okay, yeah, so you want me to read Jeremiah first? Jeremiah first, yeah, just do the Old yeah. Testament reading first. Okay, so we're going to start with Jeremiah. Uh, this is chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That's uh, from the prophet Jeremiah. And now uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God, the Father himself, and the Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. There ends that reading as well. Um, Greg, what do you got? Well, first Sunday of Advent. And so we begin our four-week season of preparing for the celebration of the birth of Christ and, and also preparing our hearts and minds for his eventual triumphant return, which may occur in our lifetimes, may not occur for another 2,000 years. We just don't know. But uh, we often will look at passages that we read in the Old Testament that uh, we now read back the messianic prophecies into these passages, and specifically the prophecy of Jesus as the Messiah. And so these, these often get scheduled during the season of Advent, these, these messianic prophecies from the Old Testament, which we read forward into uh, the birth and life of Jesus. And so that's what we do with this Jeremiah passage, but we've actually studied Jeremiah a few times this fall. So we kind of remember what's going on with this community, right? Jeremiah is the, the weeping or the wailing prophet. They have, uh, you know, the Israel has misbehaved, disobeyed God. Jeremiah has been wandering around Jerusalem, telling them you've got to knock it off for a kingdom from the North will come and destroy you. They ignore him. The kingdom from the north comes in and destroys them, takes them into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah is left wandering around the ruins of Jerusalem, still trying to preach and prophesy to this exiled community living in Babylon. And then we get to this passage, Jeremiah 33, that the days are surely coming, says the Lord, that I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. So people are hungry for justice and righteousness. They've been exiled from their own community, their city, their holy city has been destroyed. And Jeremiah says, there will come a time where things will be restored, right? Um, and our, our stewardship campaign for this year was a couple chapters back in Jeremiah where he talks about God does have a plan for you, a plan for you to flourish and not suffer a plan for a future with hope. And so uh, this is a season of hopeful anticipation. And so Jeremiah gives us some hope, which again, we're reading back as Christians and seeing the messianic prophecies reflecting the birth of Jesus. Any thoughts there, Damon? <laughs> and sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a text about salvation. Certainly, right? The, the, this is uh, anticipating the, the salvation of deliverance from exile um for the folks right um and we uh, and so it's a hopeful expectation for for some sort of a salvation in this text and it and it's a text that helps us to recall the historic um salvific works of god um within the judeo-christian history i suppose for that or tradition for lack of a better way of saying it um, and I think during Advent, we are also hopefully expectant of some sort of salvation, right? That what salvation looks like for us is different um, than what it looks like for those living in exile. Um, and so I think 
we see sort of reflections or kind of or um, the hope of salvation through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is, I think, a reflection of the hope that's found in this in passage in this passage from Jeremiah and in similar passages. If that makes sense, like the ones from Isaiah. Um, yeah. Read every Advent. Mm-hmm. And what what I appreciate you're doing here, Damon, is um, we often read these passages from the Old Testament prophets and just automatically map on top of them the birth of Jesus Christ 600 years later. And you're trying to make a distinction here that uh, there is certainly a story of salvation, though the salvation of the people of Israel from their exile in Babylon and our salvation through Christ are, are different. And so just making that distinction that we often gloss over that distinction in Advent and just immediately assume all of these prophecies that we read about in Jeremiah and Isaiah are, are that. And I appreciate the, yeah, the delineation that you have there. So yeah, I, I want to try to, to honor the context in which this, you know, the divine proclamation was made. Uh, right you know uh, yeah what what jumped out of me at this jeremiah passage though was what salvation looks like and it's justice and righteousness in the land and so i want to i like that part of this jeremiah passage and now i want to flip to the thessalonians passage we just read and see how these two things might relate and so the thessalonians passage does a deep dive into this love right and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you, so that you may strengthen your hearts in holiness and you may be blameless uh, before God. And there is a um, theology and Bible professor, I think he's serving at Princeton right now, named Dr. Cornell West. Um, and he has this really simple quote. And he says, justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. So when we are fulfilling this call that we read in Thessalonians to increase and abound in love for one another, just as um, in this case, the writer of Thessalonians is abounding in love for his community. um, What does love look like when it is enacted in the world? What does that, and, and, I don't think that Paul was talking about a romantic love. He's not saying that, um, you know, I, I, I love you in a Valentine's Day way. He was saying, I love you and that I care for your whole being as a person. I care for shalom for you. I want you to have peace in your life. I, and so then what does that look like? And, um, and so I like this contrast between Jeremiah talking about salvation looking like justice and righteousness in the land. And then Paul talking about um, love and love for one another. And what I think the connection I, I'm making in my head is that we as Christians are called to live that kind of a love in the world, a love that leads to justice and righteousness, right? Yeah, it's, um, you kind of mentioned this, I'd, and you'll probably do it. I'd be curious to see what version uh, in the Greek that word love is. Um, you know, folks probably know this. There's maybe three or four different kind of uh, versions of the word love that, that get used um, in the scriptural witness. And, uh, you know, one is that eros romantic uh, kind of love. And then one is uh, what becomes eventually the, the basis of uh, Philadelphia, uh, Philos, uh, which is that sort of brotherly uh, love. And one is agape, which is the sort of uh, self-sacrificing love. Yeah, so I'd I'd be curious to see what what the word is. Yeah, go ahead. Which one do you think it is? Because I just looked it up. Well, I'm hoping it's the last one. It's the agape, and you're absolutely right. And so, um, yeah, the the passage in Greek, himas de ho kiros plenosai kai perusia te agape, and so it's, it's uh, I, I now want the Lord to increase and to abound in you this love, this agape, this unconditional love. Um, and this is where we get into that idea that uh, justice is what love looks like in public. An unconditional love for people would be desiring the best for them, desiring a life of wholeness 
and healing. And so that means that um, when we have the potential to, we are called to help enact justice and righteousness on behalf of the people we love, right? And that's how it plays out in public. Yeah, yep. And that we're not talking about, um, you know, public displays, displays of affection. <laughs> uh, and we're not even talking about familial love. I think oftentimes, especially in Advent and leading up to Christmas, we there's so much emphasis, even just in the world around us, about, uh, you know, uh, the importance of spending time with your loved ones, right? And that could mean our families, it could mean our close friends, and, you know, the people who who we treat like family, um, but this is not even that. <laughs> it, this is the this is the kind of love that that drives us to love our neighbors um, as we love ourselves uh, and to love our strangers as well. It's that the the love that moves us to serve others, uh, regardless of how close emotionally we are to them. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I, I love in the Thessalonians too. I, I appreciate this. Night and day we pray most earnestly for you. And there's a there's a sense too that part of that love is this earnest prayer for others, uh, that, that we want the best for them, but not that we just pray, but that we enact that love, right? That we we embody that love in the world in a yeah. way that again is is not just public displays of affection hugging Damon when I see him, but wanting the best for Damon and working in the world to ensure that that, that happens. Yeah, it'd be interesting to me to, to, to think about who are our loved ones, um, you know, and, and who are we called to, to make our loved ones, um, that, that sort of a thing. But is this, uh, which banner are we going to carry in? Love. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, see, now you just, now people are going to notice. I don't know if they would have caught on. We're, uh, we're mixing Someone would have noticed the traditional <laughs> Advent themes. Oftentimes during the season of Advent, there's a series, we have a series of banners, and oftentimes we generally follow the same, um, themes, right? And I think, I think it goes hope, peace, joy, love. So usually the first Sunday of Advent, we focus on the theme of hope. The second is peace. The third is joy. And the fourth is love. But we've, we've mixed them up this year just for you to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> but Damon's already spoiled the surprise. So see, and I know. always thought that it was peace, hope, love, and joy. Um, peace, but hope, it, love. Yeah, but it doesn't really matter because they were invented in the 1950s. So. Yeah, I was at a workshop a couple of weeks ago on worship, and um, the <laughs> workshop leader had a slightly jaded view of the Advent wreath and the themes, and she claimed, and I have not verified this claim, that the Advent wreath and the themes on the Advent wreath, those four themes, were uh, were created by Cokesbury, which is a Christian uh, wholesale supply shop and, and, and bookseller. Uh, to sell advent wreaths and to sell people on these themes. Um, I don't know if that's actually true or not. The, the wreath is an ancient Christian symbol, certainly. The advent wreath with the four candles and the Christ candle in the middle, I don't know how far back that symbol goes, but uh, this workshop leader uh, was a little bit skeptical that that was anything more than a marketing <laughs> No, I think those are good themes to focus on during the season of advent regardless, right? Sure, yeah. Sure. I mean, you could focus on anything, right? I, um, but it, it, it's the sort of thing that it seems to me like these things end up reinforcing each other, right? Like whether or not Cokesbury invented it or they caught wind of a trend that was catching on in churches from, you know, one pastor says to another, oh, we're doing this this year. Oh, I heard they were, that happened over there. You know, families from across the country get together at Christmas and they talk about this stuff, right? And then Cokesbury is, oh, well, we can help churches. If this is what churches want to do, we can help them celebrate in this way with these worship aids. And then it, you know, it all feeds into, into each other. But 
we'll call it self-reinforcing. Is that? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. But it's not, uh, you know, a, defi a divine decree uh, that the first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday of hope or peace or joy or love. Hopefully all the Sundays in Advent are about all of those things. But. Indeed. But this year we will be celebrating the first Sunday of Advent as a focus on love. And uh, that's the kind of, uh, that's, that's the direction this is headed. But um, yeah, I don't know. So you think this will preach? I think it'll preach. Um, I, I appreciated your, uh, your clarification on the Jeremiah passage. I think um, Dan Deffenbaugh is rubbing off on both of us as a biblical scholar. Um, Dan, yeah, I can't, that, that came to me not from Dan Deffenbaugh. Um, um, yeah, that came from by my, um, my undergraduate and my seminary studies where it put a big, not big emphasis, but a reminder of like, the, like these things had meaning in the context in which they were written <laughs> um and to uh, yeah and so we need to honor that and pay attention to it not that we can't still find new meaning in it or right. not that we can't find meaning for ourselves in it um we, we can do both these things they're not mutually exclusive and that's i think that's the key so we don't take away the tradition that people have of these beloved texts uh talking about the birth story or narrative of Jesus and also recognizing that they have meaning in their own context, which would have uh, been a foreshadowing or a precursor to that, but also had their own um, significance. So, yeah. And I think like, knowing that and paying attention to that original context, I think deepens our understanding and appreciation of it and, and helps us to understand our stories and our interpretations and our narratives all the better right it doesn't take away <laughs> from anything and uh, not in my experience at least yeah no i think it, it enhances certainly so i yeah. i appreciated that and hope you will continue us on that path throughout the season of advent this year in the monday check-ins yeah i can you know i mean i'll be here so i'll probably do, <laughs> do that <laughs> should we switch gears yeah, let's do that. Let's uh, let's talk about what's going on in okay. the life of the church. And, and, and there's a lot, really, uh, which is very exciting. So we are launching into the season of Advent. So we'll have four Sundays uh, where we do focus on these uh, these themes we've been talking about. This first Sunday is the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. Um, and so we won't have any choirs in worship, but we are going to have some special music, uh, flute and piano. Uh, Sunday, December 5th, the second Sunday of Advent, is um, going to be the Hastings College Choir is going to come help us lead worship on Sunday, December 5th, which we're very excited about. And then the afternoon of Sunday, December 5th at 3 p.m., the Hastings College uh, Choir, as well as the band, will be leading a service of lessons and carols that culminates in a uh, their singing of uh, Rudder's uh, Gloria Cantata. So that's very exciting. That's the second Sunday of Advent, December 5th. So 11 or 1030 worship Hastings College Choir will be there three o'clock, come back to church for a service of lessons and carols and the Gloria. Sunday, December 12th uh, is our chancel choir and our Calvin Westminster Youth Choir will be combining forces and uh, singing a choral cantata for us, which is entitled A Song Unending. And this promises to be really meaningful as well. There will be some congregational hymn singing involved. Now that's that must be different, Greg, than the song that never ends. It is different than the song that never ends, which you will not start singing now because we don't need that earworm today, Damon. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that's Sunday, December twelfth. Uh, we will just have one service that day on uh, at ten thirty to encourage everyone to come and attend that one. And then uh, December nineteenth, the third sun, no, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Uh, will be our traditional service of lessons and carols here at the church. We'll have different groups leading different parts of that worship service. Uh, so our Celebrate Praise Band will lead some of it. Our children's handbells will lead some of it. It promises to be a really meaningful service. And then we're, then we're at Christmas Eve, Damon. Yeah. Which is literally just uh, a month and three days away. Month and two days away. So here it comes. And Christmas Eve, we've got uh, 
we're going to do our service over at College View, where our chancel choir and uh, your pastor heads over there and uh, provides a service for the residents and families of uh, College View. And then we'll have a 5.30 family-oriented service, a 7.30 traditional service, and an 11 o'clock Vespers service in our chapel. And that'll be the first worship service we've had in our chapel, I think, since the start of COVID. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. I've done a funeral in there since then, but other than that, I don't think we've done any other worship services. Yeah, so, and uh, we were able, thanks to uh, some wonderful help from volunteers and the Congregational Life Committee, Sunday, <clears throat> this past Sunday after church, uh, we got most of the, uh, most of the greens uh, attached to their various uh, hooks and nails and, uh, and stands and other stuff so the church is really pretty much mostly decorated uh, for the advent season had a very nice hanging of the greens uh, themed service on sunday if folks want to uh, missed and want to check it out uh, they can find it on our facebook page and we are also hopefully soon uh, we'll be arriving in people's mailboxes this year's version of the advent devotional guide um, it's uh, titled The Work of Hope, and uh, folks can get it and follow along with it. And connected with that, we are going to, once again this year, encourage and invite people to participate in a reverse Advent um, project. So for each day during Advent, there is a, a household item of some sort uh, that is a requested item from one of four of our um, charitable partner agencies in Hastings. And we're inviting folks to collect those during Advent and uh, bring them to the church. And then in the new calendar year, the new Gregorian year, uh, we will um, distribute those uh, to some of our partner agencies. So uh, it's kind of a way of encouraging folks to, to make the Advent season a season of self-emptying in some way instead of a season of self-filling. Uh, which is what you would do when you pull the little chocolate out of the thing. You can still pull the chocolate out of the thing. That's fine. But uh, you can also do this. So, Excellent. Uh, Christian Ed stuff, we are taking this week off because it is Thanksgiving week, but we will be back in the full swing of things the following week, which means we'll have our Wednesday night programming. And it also means that we will have some great Sunday school options for both uh, children, youth, and adults. Tell us about uh, the adult ed forum that's going on December 5th and 12th. Yeah, uh, right now, Lindsay Kluver, who's a Hastings College alum, a former uh, First Pres intern uh, while she was at Hastings College, and a United Theolo a seminary classmate of mine, um, is doing a, a three-part series uh, connecting the arts and Advent. So it's called Creating Hope, and it's sort of using arts as, as a way of exploring our faith uh, during the season of Advent. So uh, she offered the first session this past Sunday. Uh, we're taking this Sunday off because of Thanksgiving weekend, and then she will return on December 5th and 12th uh, to wrap that up. And if you missed the first session, that's okay. You can still jump in uh, for the December 5th and the December 12th go around. So uh, you, won't, you won't be lost. It'll be just fine. We are recording those um, and we're going to get them posted to YouTube. Hopefully I'll get the session from Sunday posted to YouTube today. So. Yeah. In fact, why don't we send out that link when we send out the link for the Monday check-in as well to prime the pump for folks to hopefully attend on the 5th and the 12th and also just to get them uh, thinking artistically and creatively as we begin this season of Advent together. Yeah, so. Cool, cool, right. anything else? Man, that's a lot of announcements. I think we've covered all of our bases. Announcements, announcements, announcements. Uh, would you like to offer us a closing prayer? I would love to, let's, uh, right. let's pray. Gracious God, as, as we head into this week, of thanksgiving, may we have hearts full of gratitude. Gratitude for you, God. Gratitude for your presence in our lives. Gratitude for your presence in our community. Gratitude for the call that you place on each of our lives to, to be your hands and feet in the world. 
as we reflect on these scriptures from Jeremiah and Thessalonians, Lord, may we think about what the love is that you're calling us to. May we reflect on our call to be agents of love in the world, which may mean being agents of justice to help support those who are in need. Continue to bless and guide the work of this church as we begin this season of Advent. May we be a source of hope for people in this season of hopeful anticipation. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, there you have it. Uh, from this, uh, I guess, not in between time moment. Uh, that's the Monday check-in for this week. So with all of those things said and done, uh, toodaloo.